Before we dive into this incredible story, I have to mention the source for pretty much everything related to this car and its history, which is the amazing book called Apollo GT, The American Ferrari by Rob Northrup. I wish I could point you to a place to purchase it, but it's virtually impossible to buy as it only came out as a limited run. I was able to get my copy for like over $300 from a UK bookseller. Regardless, aside from my opinions here and there, that resource is pretty much where all the data is coming from. And yeah, big shout out to Rob Northrup and his incredible work on the history of this car. Now, I've made quite a few videos, one on this channel, but many more on my motorcycle channel talking about great men who set out to build their own vehicles. And one thing that I've found is that it's really helpful to get an understanding of what's going on in the world around that time and what the setting was that brought them to entertain this ludicrous idea of building their own car. In other words, you don't just wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm going to build my own car. That's just not how it works. It takes the right person, or in this case, the right group of people, and the right timing to get any sort of success with a startup in the automotive world. It also takes one other thing, but more on that later. The birth of the American sports car really comes after World War II. American GIs came back home with a new passion for small, fun, sporty vehicles, and the result would really be a lucrative sports car export business, mainly for British companies like MG and Morgan and Austin Healey, and of course Jaguar and other European manufacturers like Alfa Romeo and Ferrari, and also Porsche. By the year 1960, despite manufacturing 65% of all cars in the world, the US market was still basically the entire British sports car market and becoming a significant chunk of the rest of the European sports car manufacturing business. These sports cars really found a home in America as driving became more than just a necessity. In the years after the war, Americans basically learned that cars could be fun, and the funnest cars in the world were being made overseas. But soon the owner of these imports found that apparently these European manufacturers didn't have all the same values as American manufacturers. That Ford and Chevy reliability, capable of carrying you well past 100,000 miles, rather trouble-free even at this time in the middle of a century, well, it wasn't quite there on, say, your average MG or even Aston Martin. These were finicky cars. As Northrop says in his book, yes, a Ferrari could run the 24 hours of Le Mans, but it might not make it on your 24-minute commute. Of course, this ongoing lack of sophistication and reliability and usability would really be a key, but not the sole reason for the decline of the British automotive industry through the 60s and 70s as American, but really as Japanese manufacturers began to take over with their more simple, reliable setups. As much as American sports car enthusiasts were impressed with these lightweight, tiny sports cars coming out of Europe, many across the pond were becoming equally enamored with the American formula for speed, basically massive, powerful V8s. And so in the years following World War II, we see a few attempts at making a sort of crossover between the European and the American formula, from the Nash Healey sports car to, of course, the later V8-powered AC Ace, and then later that would become the Cobra. This new trend of trying to pair a European-styled chassis and body to American muscle was really becoming a thing in the early 60s, and it's at this time that three people would come together to do exactly that, with a new car company, and their names were Milton Brown, Ron Plessia, and Ned Davis. Brown and Plessia had met their senior year of high school. They were two men crazy about sports cars with a history of being rather mechanically minded. Together, they would spend their spare time doing things like rebodying cars. Even in these early years, the two dreamed of one day building their own car. They would sketch designs of what it would look like, and then in 1957, Brown was actually able to travel to Europe as a correspondent for a magazine called Sports Car Pictorial. He visited places like Lotus, which really inspired him to believe in the potential of actually building his own similar kind of sports car factory to what Lotus was doing. In 1958, the two paired up to design the chassis for the first Formula Junior race car in America, known as the Apache. And then in 1960, the car enthusiast duo would become more of a business-minded trio when a young entrepreneur with loads of ideas named Ned Davis became friends with Plessia and Brown. And it was in Ned Davis that they confided their desire to build their own car. 
Now that same year, Brown took a second trip to Europe. Well, technically speaking, it was his honeymoon, but that doesn't mean there isn't some spare time for car stuff. And circumstances would make it possible for them to actually stay in Europe for a longer period of time than just a trip. While in Europe, the dream to build his own car really became solidified. While attending Monaco for the Grand Prix race, Milton met Frank Reisner, a guy who was literally building his own cars. He was making custom bodies for Pook 500s, and ultimately Milton got the chance to tour his factory, where he saw, you know, a few people working in pretty rudimentary conditions, but they were building cars. They were banging out body panels and pretty much doing what he needed people to do for him if he was going to have his own car. And it's here that he learned not only that this kind of thing could be scaled by contracting out specific work of things like painting or body work or assembly to the same companies that a lot of the big manufacturers used. And everything really came together for Milton in this moment. He knew the car that he wanted to build, a Ferrari-like sports car with American reliability, built on GM's 215 cubic inch V8, and Milton knew who could help him make this a reality, so he partnered with Reisner to build his dream car, an Italian-American sports car. Milton actually wrote Ned Davis at this time, that is the business side of the trio, and he said, and I quote, we're going to build the American Ferrari. The group started with a prototype estimated to cost $5,000, and Brown footed the bill, taking a massive risk, really. Ron Plescia was to design the car based on the previous sketches that they'd already made, and Milt was to use his connections overseas to basically make this project a reality. Now, before you can design and build a car, you have to have an idea of what you're trying to accomplish with that vehicle. The Apollo GT, affectionately named Apollo by Brown's wife Paula, and really embodying the spirit of this car, Apollo is the Greek god of strength and beauty, and this car would really be that. It was essentially a middle ground between everything that makes a European sports car, we'll say that's the beauty side, and then, you know, the strength and power of an American sports car. So power and reliability coupled with a sleek and lightweight body and chassis. A sort of middle ground between, say, a Ferrari or Maserati, and something like a Jaguar XKE. To get everything going, they really began to study companies like Jaguar and Porsche, companies whose sole focus was to relentlessly make great cars, and to basically never cut costs despite making very different products. But the style was to be that of a thoroughly Italian grand touring car, a sort of streamlined, beautiful body set on a custom lightweight chassis, based on experience from building race cars. And then pairing that to Buick or GM's lightweight but powerful and reliable 215 cubic inch aluminum V8. The team also spoke endlessly to owners of Jags and Ferraris and Maseratis and even Corvettes and Aston Martins, and these owners did love their cars, but they just didn't use them as daily drivers, and that was really the hole that Apollo sought to fill. Priced neatly between the cheaper Jaguar and Porsche options and even Corvette, but, you know, quite a bit less than the exotic offerings from Ferrari and Mercedes and Aston Martin, they figured that price-wise, they were right where they needed to be. Now, they even focused on little things like making the car easy to get into. You know, why do sports cars have to be so difficult to get into? I mean, today, sports cars aren't really that hard to get into, but at this time, they really were. And the reality is, they didn't need to be. And the Apollo GT had that sort of level of comfort. It had big doors, and it would even come with an automatic transmission option, which was something entirely unheard of on sports cars at this time. Now, building a transcontinental vehicle is no easy feat, especially in the 1960s. I mean, there is no email, so keeping things simple would really be key to the Apollo's success when you can't just, you know, constantly be messaging each other. Milt decided to go with the Buick suspension as well as the engine. He knew that this setup would provide just as good or perhaps even better handling than, say, an XKE, and some would argue that he wasn't quite right in that regard. But this suspension was great. It would find itself on cars like, you know, the Jensen Healey sports car some 10 years later. But really, the main purpose of this was that it was simple. And simpler is usually better, and this setup would be world simpler than what was on contemporary Italian machines, for example. They would never make it as a car company making super complex parts for every single part of the car. The reliable Borg Warner T10 transmission was picked for those wanting a manual transmission, and this transmission would be used on loads of sports cars going forward, including Corvettes and Cobras and Mustangs, 
But of course, that Buick Dynaflow two-speed automatic was also an option for sports car enthusiasts who wanted just a simpler option. And this was really rare at this time. To have a sports car with an automatic transmission in the very early 60s was it just was unheard of. For production, these tried and true simpler options really proved wise for the new company, coupled with that legendary and really innovative for its time aluminum Buick V8 engine making 225 horsepower and really keeping the weight down. The mechanical setup was to really be bulletproof. And this was to be the kind of sports car that enthusiasts could actually drive to work or across the country reliably. But getting a car to go from sketches to an actual prototype is much easier said than done. The body in the interior would be influenced heavily on the character of Ferrari's grand touring machines. Of course, there's also no denying the influence of the Jaguar's E-Type, which had just come out. In a lot of ways, the overall look was sort of an amalgamation of a lot of the great grand touring cars that were available at this time. Even with the interior. There was no need to be different just to be different. And I really respect that about this car. It wasn't just trying to be exotic for the sake of being exotic so that you could justify the price tag. Everything was pretty simple. But it also had this sense of quality and sort of luxury. The comfort of the seats and the interior was more important than just having some sort of exotic look for the sake of being exotic. And in this way, especially with the interior, the Apollo, many would say, was actually better than an E-Type because it was more comfortable, it was easier to get into. I'm sure E-Type owners would argue that that's not true, but how many of them have actually driven an Apollo? By June of 1962, Reisner had a complete finished prototype ready to go, and it was time to ramp up for production. But how do three regular guys go about funding this kind of venture? So the three-man team created a company called IMC, International Motor Cars, which is a pretty fitting name, and they created a structure along with a board of directors, and they started asking everyone they knew for money, from friends and family putting in, you know, one or two thousand here, to larger investments. They ended up getting roughly $21,000, which today would be about 200000 Enough to at least get the whole thing kind of going. It was pretty risky, though, but they knew that they could at least get some cars built and in the hands of satisfied customers, and then going forward, they would just use the money that they make or try to raise more in investments. And IMC really took production seriously. This meant testing these cars and even at points destroying them like a regular company. Now, Ned Davis, that is the business side of the three, not as much of a sports car enthusiast, he had the privilege of driving the prototype from the dock back home to Oakland, and he was shocked by how fast the car was. That big V8 paired to a pretty lightweight chassis and body. And in that moment, Davis says that he kind of got the bug as well. Amazing that it took making his own sports car to become a car guy. Now, the car made its first public debut at a Buick dealership in San Francisco to an excited 300 people. Early testers did find some problems, but IMC knew that most of this could be fixed in production. You know, there were blind spots and a lot of overhang, which really affected the handling. They would even be forced for costs and for other reasons to switch from an aluminum body to a steel body. After much labor, the first production prototype was shipped to IMC in January of 63, and Plessio was actually sad when he saw the first production red car to come off of the ship. Much of the exotic flair for the production car was now gone because of the changes that they had to make, and I can't imagine how this must have felt. But with time, he saw that all the changes that they'd made were for the best. You know, it may not be a Ferrari or an E-Type even, but it was handsome, and it had the potential to be kind of the ultimate American Grand Touring car. A production Apollo was as much a handmade car at this time as a Ferrari or a Maserati, but the reason they were able to make such consistent panels and structures for pieces were that they were basically hammered to a form. And this was really Reisner's brilliant approach. The car sort of had a mold, a structure on which every piece was shaped and formed, and this allowed for incredible consistency. If you took an Apollo today and you stripped it down, you would think that this was a car that was produced no differently than, you know, a mass-produced Ford or Buick. They didn't use any filler to fix mistakes, which was common for a lot of exotic manufacturers at this time, and that's because there were no mistakes. These cars were incredibly well-built. Once the bodies were finished, they would be shipped and brought back to Oakland, where the cars were assembled and tested and put through quality control, which was pretty much just Milton Brown. He was all of those things. 
And basically the guys would take the cars home, they'd drive them around, work out the bugs, and then the car would be ready to go. In retrospect, the owners do admit that you know, better quality control and testing would have probably been beneficial. Now, without a large budget for TV and magazine ads and pretty much no dealer network, well, two dealers to be exact, Ned Davis set out to make his own flyers and brochures to show off the car, making really nice full-color pamphlets like this at this time. This was really no easy feat. I know today anybody can make this kind of thing on Canva, but at this time he really made nice stuff and it's really, really impressive. Some of the more enthusiast local California publications covered the Apollo, and they did rave about its performance, which really helped to get the word out. But through its two-year run, a big chunk of the sports car market, especially outside of California, never even knew this car existed. Even in their single biggest piece of exposure, which was the Love Bug, few knew that the Thorndike Special wasn't just a custom Jaguar. Recently, I showed my kids that movie. My dad was saying that he thought that car was a Jag, and I was looking at it, and I had seen Jay Leno's video about the Apollo GT, and even I wasn't quite sure if it was the car, but I was pretty sure in my mind I'd seen this car before. I'd like to tell you that the Apollo just sold by the thousands and then millions, and thankfully today, you know, they're one of the premier American automotive manufacturers. But as I'm guessing you know, that just isn't the case. In trying to keep up with the ongoing horsepower wars in America, IMC decided to get a new engine for the Apollo instead of tuning the Buick V8. In this case, it was the Corvette engine. But in the end, this would prove to be a pain to get into the car and to get right with their chassis. And so, and in the end, this just created more headaches for them. But aside from the car's performance, which wasn't always perfect, but for the most part, the people who bought it were pretty satisfied. The car itself really wasn't the problem. Not to say that the formula was a guaranteed success aside from the extenuating circumstances. See, silly problems began to arise early on. For example, IMC's first dealer decided to try to promote the Apollo's GM connection by basically saying that the Apollo was a Buick, as in the all-new Buick Apollo, and it wasn't a Buick know, any more than a Lotus is a Toyota. But that didn't stop him. Even Ned Davis couldn't stop him from plastering the name Buick Apollo all over his showroom. And in response, Buick obviously wasn't happy. They forced this dealer to stop. And in response, the dealer basically had to choose between selling the Apollo cars and the Buick cars. And of course, he chose to keep selling Buicks. And at this point, the company almost went under from this because this was their dealer. Though IMC did find dealers, some that would help bring in solid sales through its few years of existence. And thanks to this support, IMC would actually release a convertible version of which only a few were actually sold. But really, erratic cash flow made things incredibly difficult. And in the end, there just wasn't enough money to do this kind of thing. It's not that the car didn't sell or have potential to sell big. The reality is you have to have a large investment to really get anywhere with this kind of product. Just paying the various vendors who make the car a reality is really difficult. And hiccups like what happened with their first dealer, that would have been no big deal if you had millions of dollars laying around. The founders look back today on the business with even more clarity. In Northrop's book, Ron Plesia says that the venture was extremely underfunded and understaffed, made worse by the complications of a product with countless parts and overseas manufacturing. Any business guru would pass out cold looking at the situation. These guys were juggling so much at this time. Starting a successful car business is difficult, even with millions of dollars. To try to start a company from the ground up with very little investment, it's amazing and impressive that they were even able to make and sell the 42 cars that they did. Perhaps the greatest miracle is the fact that there's really no bad blood between these guys. They really did their best that they could, and the business's failure was no fault of their own. Looking back, they do acknowledge that one of the biggest mistakes was the price. Initially, they were estimating between 7 and 10k. But Apollo's had a base price of $6,000. When you think about what this car was, not necessarily the single fastest car in the world, but a true hand-built and competitively specced grand touring sports car, you know, 6K then is roughly 60K today. For a completely hand-built car, it should have cost way more than this. One advisor at the time actually said that they should charge $2,000 more than a Ferrari. You know, Ferraris were around 12K then, so 14K. Just because people with that kind of money 
would actually like how expensive it is, and that guy was, in my opinion, exactly right. I mean, today, what would a company like this charge for a hand-built sports car that's on par with some of the best cars in the world? A lot more than 60K, I can tell you that much. In the end, IMC was forced to close the door, but Apollo's legacy lives on, not only in the surviving examples, but also in the influence it had on subsequent generations of American Grand Touring cars. Its attempt to blend American power with European aesthetics paved the way for future models that aim to capture the elusive formula of performance and elegance. The Apollo GT's development and history really tells a compelling story of ambition, collaboration, and the challenges faced by a niche automaker in a competitive market. In my opinion, it's a story all too relevant. Today, as sports cars themselves seem to be moving to an even more niche place, the Apollo GT creation marked an earnest endeavor to bridge the gap between continents, showcasing the potential of an American Grand Touring car with a touch of European finesse. While its production was short-lived, the car remains a symbol of the era's design philosophy and the pursuit of automotive excellence. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I really enjoyed learning about this car. And yeah, if you liked it, make sure to subscribe for more videos like this, and we'll see you in the next one. Drive safe.